Hey guys, this is Patrick from SDH, and today we are going to talk about these things. Now, these are the AMD Epic 7773X chips, also known as Milan X. And these are not just any Milan X chips, these are actually the 64 core versions. Now, you might say, Patrick, I have heard about 64 core CPUs for years. AMD Epic Milan was launched in 2021, and Rome was launched in 2019. So, 64 core CPUs, they have been out for a long time. What makes these special? What makes these special is that these things each have three quarters of a gigabyte of cache. That means that in these two chips that I'm holding in my hand right now, I have a total of 1.5 gigabytes of level three cache, which is absolutely insane. Just for some, you know, frame of reference here, if you had the Intel Xeon Platinum 8380, which is their, you know, 40 core CPU, you would only have 60 megabytes of level three cache on one of those or 120 megabytes of level three cache on two of them, which basically means that these have well over 10 times the cache of their Intel counterparts. So today we're gonna to talk about how these things are made. We're gonna talk about the performance. And for that, we have a special guest. Hey guys, this is Wendell, not from STH. And today we're gonna to take a look at the Milan launch. And if you don't know who that is, that is Wendell from Level 1 Techs. We were both out in Austin, well I live here and he flew out, but we were at AMD headquarters just a few days ago and you know we get we finished this entire thing, we finished our dinner and we said hey we should go film something so we went back to his hotel room and we did a quick little segment and so we're gonna have a portion of that later in this video and we're gonna talk about that when we get to it. There he is. By the end of this video, what I really wanna do is talk about not just our testing and some of the other testing that's been in the market, but I also wanna talk about, well, should you go buy this? And like, how do you even think about going and buying these things? And like, you know, what, what's AMD doing with this line anyway? Because this is not a full replacement for the AMD Epic Milan series. This isn't like, oh, we had Milan and now we have Milan X. Milan X is like a segment or a family of processors within the broader Milan series. So it, you're still gonna go buy Milan processors and probably the vast majority, like I don't know the exact number, who knows the exact numbers on these things, but my guess is that something probably like 90% of the processors that are gonna be sold over the next couple months are still gonna be the standard Milan, not Milan X. But at the same time, I think that these things are really important and there are some people that are just gonna, and some organizations that, that are gonna see these things and be like, this is exactly what I want. So with that, let's start getting to how the heck these things are made and then let's start getting into some details. Okay, so the quick background on Milan X, and I'm sure that there are people that are gonna go into like the nitty gritty, like all the bump pitches and like all that kind of stuff, but let's just kind of talk about what the heck AMD is even doing here. And to understand what's going on here, let's just talk about why cache is important. Well, cache is important because when you have data if you can go store that data on the package rather than having to go off package to main memory to retrieve that data, that basically means that you have an order of magnitude or more of better performance because you have lower latency, you have more bandwidth, and also the amount of power it takes to move a you know bit of data from you know in the chip to the other side of the chip is relatively small compared to having to go follow a trace all the way out to main memory and all the way back. And so it's more power efficient and it's also you know just faster. So having more capacity means that you don't have to necessarily make trips to main memory as often and that means you have more data that's close to the CPU. And because you have data that's closer to the CPU, the CPU cores are like, hey, I'm constantly fed with data rather than saying like, hey, when are you gonna get back from main memory? And like, you know, when am I gonna get this data that I need to go do compute? So that's basically the entire reason that a lot of people really love big caches. And we actually did a piece about a year ago talking about how we were gonna start entering the gigabyte era in terms of CPUs. These chips are probably the first ones that we would really say that like, you know, we have something like three quarters of a gigabyte. So we're starting to express the cache in these in terms of gigabytes rather than in just megabytes. And we cannot get into this without talking about manufacturing at least a little bit. And if you don't care about manufacturing, I would just say skip ahead. But here's basically the challenge that AMD faced. So if you look at like logic scaling and the density and stuff, when you start talking about analog circuits, those things really are not pushing at the same rate that you're seeing like the 
compute circuits that you would have like for cores and things like that. That's called like logic. And somewhere in the middle of those, you actually have SRAM, which would be like your cache. And so if you create a die that basically has your logic and your SRAM on the same die, well, that basically means that you have part of what you're manufacturing scales well, and the other part of what you're manufacturing is not scaling as well. And so that kind of creates challenges. And that's exactly why we see things like AMD has a giant IO die in the middle of their package, because, well, you can go do your stuff there for IO, and you don't necessarily have to go do that signaling on the expensive die that you'd use for your logic. So that's why they're actually on two different process nodes. And AMD is thinking about this and saying, hey, maybe there's another opportunity. And one of the big challenges is that if they wanted to expand the cache size and they were still trying to use that seven nanometer or something like that, what you'd basically see is that the overall die size of each of those compute dies would start to get just huge because, well, you have a lot of SRAM, you have a lot of cache, plus you have your cores, but it's not necessarily an efficient use because SRAM doesn't scale as well as logic. So basically what AMD did is this thing called vCache. And what they did with 3D vCache is they basically created SRAM. So they basically created just little cache dies and they said, okay, well, we can't, we don't want to create one die with all of our cache and our logic, so our cores. What we're going to do is we're just going to go take our cache die and we're going to go add another cache die on top of that. It's called 3D stacking. And it literally looks like, you know, like Legos or something like that almost where you just go and you take, you know, you have your base die and then you go put a, a cache die on top. And then you have to have uh, other little bits that are really just there to make sure that everything's level. So you can actually put it like a heat spreader and stuff like that on it. And if you've ever played with Legos, you probably are like, yeah, that's super easy. You just go and you just take it and you just plop the things on. I know a three-year-old that can do that, no problem. Why is it such a big deal in chip design? And the reason it's a big deal is because, well, there's a whole lot that has to go on because you all of a sudden need to have wires and things going up out through the top of one die. And then you have to have wires going to the other die. And then you have to go figure out how to bond those two dies together so they don't move. You can actually have them be reliable. And by the way, you're doing this at super, super small scale. And you have to also scale out your manufacturing to be able to create these things cheaply and reliably. So there's a whole bunch of challenges and that's just some of them. I'm gonna let other people go into the manufacturing side in more detail, but that's the high level reason that 3D vCache, well, we couldn't do it before. The actual dies themselves apparently have had the ability and the bumps to be able to go do this since like the Rome generation in 2019, but it's taken a little while to actually get the manufacturing to be able to go and do that reliably at scale. So the super easy way to think about Milan X, just in terms of how all these chips get packaged together, is that in the middle of the package, you have your IO die, and that's not gonna change from the just standard Milan series, right? That's the same thing. But what we do have is we actually have our eight CCDs. And actually those are basically the same as we would have on a Milan part, except all of the Milan X ones will be eight CCDs. There's not gonna be any like, you know, four CCD configs or anything like that. They're all eight can be populated because we are trying to get as much cache as possible. And then on each of those eight CCDs, you normally have 32 megabytes to the level of three cache, but then you have TSVs, and those are basically hybrid bonded to another die that sits on top, and that has 64 megabytes of level three cache that sits on top of each of the eight CCDs. And then when you add all that stuff up, you get a total of 768 megabytes of level three cache. I know that there are a lot of silicon engineers out there that are gonna be like, but there's so much more cool engineering. Why didn't you go into it? But if you're just here to go learn about CPUs and like figure out what the heck's going on, the easy way to think about it is that there's super complex manufacturing technology that basically allowed AMD to go and add another half a gigabyte of cache onto their processors. But that kind of brings us to the SKU stack. And let's just kind of, I talked about this with the IO die just a second ago, but let's just kind of level set here. Milan and Milan X, so the Epic 7003 series, they're, they're really not that different other than this cache. Um, there are some differences in terms of clock speeds that we're gonna talk about and stuff like that. But the basic difference of this is of course, just the cache. But with that, let's talk about the models really quickly. And what I have here is the AMD Epic 7773X. The X means that we have Milan X and that's the high cache version, but there are only four SKUs that are gonna be out. That basically means that we have 16, 24, 32, and 64 core variants. So if you wanna have something like a 56 or a 28 core CPU or something like that, well, you're probably not gonna get one of these or maybe, maybe you'll disable cores, I don't know. But you're basically not gonna get one of these Milan X chips 
Instead, you're probably just gonna get these standard Milan chips if you want those kind of certain core counts. And so I'm gonna just put up this chart. Now this is definitely a little bit of an eye chart, but basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna look. Now I'm gonna put up this chart and it's definitely an eye chart, but I'm just kind of showing if you wanna pause it here or something like that. This is the basically the AMD Epic 7003 series without the single socket only P SKUs. And these are also the publicly available parts because there are a lot of not publicly available parts that um, are not on here. And what you basically notice is with these chips, you get a couple things. One, you do get the additional cash. Two, they are more expensive. So AMD is definitely charging you because they're doing you know something different. You're getting more silicon and all that kind of stuff. So they are charging you more. The other thing to note though, is the fact that you do lose a little bit of clock speed. So it's not just a necessarily one of these things where you just, oh, hey, for free, we just get extra cash. Oh no, you're actually gonna lose a little clock speed because of it. The clock speed delta compared to some of the other chips, like say that 7773X to the 7763, for example, or if you look at like the frequency optimized 32 core parts versus the, this Milan X part, what you're basically gonna see is that you lose something like 10-ish percent in terms of clock speed. That's just a general number, I'm rounding a little bit there, but just conceptually think about it this way, you get three times as much level three cash, but you lose 10% of your clock speed. But since we basically have the same Milan cores that we had in the previous generation, it's really the cash that's different and the clock speed, what we basically do is just kind of look at some of our standard metrics. Like for example, how much you pay per core. This chart shows what you're basically paying on a per core basis. And you're gonna see that the Milan X, so the X SKUs, they definitely ch command a premium even over some of the frequency optimized SKUs. Now, of course, the highest dollar per core is actually the eight core variant. And the reason for that is, well, that eight core variant that is specifically designed for things like, like databases where you have crazy licensing costs. So the more frequency and cash you can get in a low footprint, like an eight core thing is actually really good in terms of your licensing because the cost of licensing the CPUs is like way higher than the hardware. So, you know, if you charge a little bit more for a core, people really don't care because the software costs are just so much higher than the hardware costs. And just to kind of give you guys some idea in terms of like how much more cash we're talking about, it's like 3X and here's what it kind of looks like in terms of cash per core. So you can basically see that, well, the 7773X is about three times as much cash per core as the other 64 core variants. You will also notice that that eight core 7 2F3, that actually has a ton of cash because it's an eight core part with a lot of cash. So that was kind of like the Milan X precursor, although it doesn't have these stacks. It is a little bit interesting that we did not have a, you know, 3DV cache, or a, a Milan X version of the eight core part. I don't know if that's a technical thing or like why, or maybe that thing just already had enough cash that like, hey, maybe it's enough without it, but it just is kind of interesting that we didn't get that because that is a market segment that will definitely pay a premium. Also on this chart, just one quick thing, you're gonna notice that mark at the top. Now this particular chart is actually cash per core. However, that 60 megabyte line at the top of our chart, that's actually, think of that if you had a 40 core Intel Xeon Platinum, like 8380, so like an Ice Lake, like top of the line Intel part right now, that line up top with 60 megabytes, that's what you would get. And that's not per core on that chip, that's for all 40 cores. So when we say that AMD is doing something different, well, I think that that is a really good example of like, yeah, AMD is definitely doing something different here. Now on the frequency optimized parts, you definitely do pay a premium on a per core basis to get that additional frequency. However, when you get the additional cash per core, well, you don't necessarily, you're not paying a premium for that extra cash per core because it's not necessarily as simple as like when you have frequency increases, you just kind of see performance increase. Um, there's actually a little bit more to it than that. And so what you actually see is that you get a discount on a cash per core per dollar basis with the Milan X series versus the standard Milan SKUs. And so the interesting thing is, well, what does that mean? Like, why the heck are we doing this? Like, I get the fact that cash is good, but what does that mean in terms of performance? And so this is where I'm gonna introduce Wendell again, because I think Wendell has a pretty interesting take at some of these things. And while Wendell is speaking, what I'm gonna do is we're actually gonna go and put some of the charts 
from some of the third party vendors as well as AMD. And we're just gonna have those go up and so you can kind of see what Wendell is talking about. Now, the vendors actually came and presented to uh, Michael, Larable, Wendell and myself, uh, and they actually presented the three, uh, you know, or, or their different bits to the three of us. And so, you know, we got to go and hear vendors emphatically say this AMD, you know, Milan X thing is awesome for our products. These were all engineering companies. So I just want to point that out real quick. They're all kind of doing some kind of like engineering or, or simulation or things like that. And so these are workloads that require a lot of compute. They are designing the products that go into, you know, that we use every day. So they're super important workloads. And frankly, you know, that's kind of like one of those things where if you can do better simulation, faster simulation, you can create better products. And that gives you a certain competitive advantage. So people are willing to go and spend a lot of money for that. Also, it's another one where software license costs are pretty high. So if you can either do more with fewer machines or licenses, well then potentially you can do better. Or if you can actually go and just do more cycles, that means you can be more competitive in the market. So there's a huge advantage to this market. And I think that some of the applications actually showed really awesome performance gains. And that is why AMD is highlighting that. So with that, let's hear from Wendell and just kind of hear, you know, let's just kind of hear what was happening. It, it's launched. It's, it's weird. The logistics of this is very weird because you can't just turn people loose and let them benchmark it because the software that this requires requires somebody that has deep, deep subject matter expertise in order to really take advantage of it. So the performance is amazing if your specific problem needs just oodles and oodles of L3 cache. So I actually went and I asked AMD for, I don't know, probably like probably 30 minutes or so today. I'm like, hey, you know, outside of HPC, High performance compute. High performance computing, you know, what are the workloads that Milan X is gonna excel in and the answer was kind of like, we don't really know. Well, they do know computational fluid dynamics. They know combination physics simulation where you're doing CFD plus other types of deformations that you may have. And they're doing electrical and physical simulations, uh, RTL, Verilog type things, you know, that stuff for CPU simulation. So AMD's dog fooding their own stuff internally. And also like the people from Siemens, the people from Ansys, the people from many companies that do these kinds of things. Solving eigenvectors is the, the name of the game here. Or solving things that don't necessarily fit into a linear array. It's like, oh, we've got an array of memory. It's rows and columns. Well, guess what? When you're doing physics simulations, it's not rows and columns. We're dealing with four dimensions. It's super linear scaling. Uh, also known as the word problem where if one painter can paint a room in so many hours, and two painters are doing better than two painters painting individually. It's a super linear speed up. It's not Amdahl's law. It's actually the opposite of that. And the prop, the what's happening there is actually really interesting because, you know, on an infinite scale, yes, yes, it's it's going to scale linearly. But when we're talking about moving from two to four nodes or from two to eight or sixteen nodes, what happens is the problem, which parallelizes really well, computational fluid dynamics, all this kind of thing, scales really well to a lot of cores. What happens is that enough of the problem domain that's been scaled for that node fits in cache such that it's actually reducing the amount of time that it has to spend communicating with main memory. And so because everything for that particular subset of the problem fits on a single processor, you see better than linear scaling because now it's not trying to juggle the whole problem on a single socket or a two socket. It's actually managing a reasonable size slice of the problem. Or even having to go over a network yeah. doing MPI, right? So that's the other um, that's the other thing. So that's definitely something that I think we're gonna be looking at um, in the future. <laughs> Who knew that you would have to size your jobs that way? Yeah, so it's, it was actually a really interesting overall day. And I think, I know Wendell on your channel, you're gonna have a whole bunch of interviews from some of the ISVs so definitely, yeah, I, I would mean, definitely go check that out. He was doing interviews all day. Uh, with AMD did folks. a good job picking customers that are really excited because this is kind of transformational for their workloads. It's like, we thought something was broken because when we went from four nodes to eight nodes, it got more than twice as fast. How can that possibly be? And then you dig into it and it's like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so I think that, you know, you have a whole bunch, of, you're gonna have a whole bunch of interviews on your channel on this. So definitely go check that out. We'll link that in the description. But it's also kind of exciting because this is, you know, <laughs> breaking new ground. I mean, having three quarters of a gigabyte of cache per socket, you can have 1.5 gigabytes of L3 in a two socket system. How insane is that? This is breaking new ground. But also, 
now's the right time. Like it doesn't make sense to have done this sooner because the software part of it is kind of catching up. And there's the other, that was, you know, it wasn't really talked about directly, but the different vendors and everybody coming together is AMD on the hardware side, meeting with software people and really doing deep analysis. I mean, this is beyond the compiler. The compiler is definitely a factor here. The linear algebra system and the, the libraries that actually do the computation, this goes beyond those kinds of integrations and lets them work with the customer. And so AMD is not saying, here's how we expect you to do linear algebra with our library. They're instead turning around and saying to Siemens like, okay, we're AMD, what do we need to build? And so their people know their product and they know where the bottlenecks are. They know where the bodies are buried and they know how they can fix and optimize their product uh, assuming that certain kinds of things are available. And so AMD says, hey, well, we can just increase the cache. Does that help you algorithmically? And it turns out that for certain kinds of algorithms, yeah, <laughs> having three quarters of a gigabyte of cache opens up doors that previously weren't open. And so, yeah, there's room for software optimization, but a lot of what we saw today was really just drop in. Like they were just dropping their processors in with not really any software changes. And immediately you get that super linear scaling for certain problems. And if we look a little bit tired in some of those shots, I'm just gonna tell you this, that we did that I think at like 10 p.m. or something like that after I think we started at like 8 or 8.30 or something like that. So we had been going like all day and we were just like, let's just do this before he flies out and stuff. And we were in his hotel and like, that's how we set it up. It was definitely not a fancy pre-planned thing. We just kind of spur of the moment, just did it. But we were definitely pretty tired. I did, however, want to go and talk about not just, you know, the idea of, you know, what we're seeing in these really engineering focused applications, but I also wanna talk about what we have seen in some of our testing to date. Now, of course, we haven't gotten to do our full benchmark suite because uh, we just had to produce something uh, before this thing came out. But one of the things I was interested in was really that trade-off between, well, what's the difference if you have less clock speed, but you have more cash? Does that mean that you're gonna end up better all the time, worse sometimes, it can be you know, worse to wash, like what's the deal with that really? And so let's kind of go through just a couple of the workloads that we've shown before on STH, and I just wanna kind of show you at a high level what's going on and what you might be able to expect. So the first one, when we do our Linux kernel compile, we actually saw a pretty darn good, like I was actually really surprised that we saw a pretty nice performance bump versus the previous gen, or not the previous gen, but the 7763, you know, we definitely got a nice performance bump with the extra cache, even though we didn't necessarily have the same, you know, clock speeds. Also, as a fun note, when we first started doing this particular compile benchmark, I mean, the times were like, like a good time was like maybe 10 minutes or something like that. And now, like, like this, this was the first chip that we have tested, I think that, or first system that we tested that actually took this benchmark down to sub one minute, which was just absolutely crazy that we finally saw something that did that. We've done four socket systems that haven't been able to do that. Now, the next one that we have is our C-Ray AK benchmark. And this is another one that we did thinking that like, oh my gosh, this is such a big one that are, that is gonna take forever for it to be, it's, it's just gonna take forever to run and like chips aren't gonna get big enough for it. But it turns out that this is definitely starting to get to that point. If you're coming from the Windows side and you're more familiar with like workstation benchmarks, this would be something kind of akin to like a Cinebench or something like that in terms of what the overall workload profile looks like. And here what you're gonna notice is the fact that we actually don't get better performance than the 7763. We actually get a little bit worse performance. And the reason for that is that this workload is really not taking advantage of that extra cache at all. I mean, it's basically, you know, the, the workload as is at the, you know, Epic when you have 256 megabytes of level three cache, you're plenty fine with this. So you just, you just don't need the extra half gigabyte of cache. And so at that point, then it becomes a clock speed gain and your game. And what you're basically seeing here is that because you have the same number of cores, but a lower clock speed that the non Milan X, so I don't know, we're gonna call that vanilla or whatever, that one is actually faster. So the important thing here is that for different workloads, you were definitely gonna see something on the range of like, you know, those engineering workloads where people are really excited and something like this where you just aren't gonna use that cash. So nobody really, you're definitely not getting any benefit from it. The next one that I'm gonna show may look like it's a little bit off in terms of how we sorted these, but it's for a specific reason, which you'll see on the next one. But this one is actually the STH NGINX performance and our CDM performance. And basically what this is, is we take trace, or we took traces from the STH website a couple of years ago, and we figured out like, here's what the website is, here's what all of the access patterns are for the STH site. 
And like, what does that look like in terms of, um, you know, workload? So we actually just kind of said, okay, here's the distribution. And then we basically created a workload that said, hey, Nginx, like, let's go, let's go, uh, let's go serve that same workload. And so what you see here is that the extra cache actually isn't helping. And the reason for that is that the uh, randomness of the workload and just the size, the problem size and all that kind of stuff of what's being served, you're not necessarily getting in that kind of sweet spot for the additional cache yet. And so this was actually kind of one that just to me, I was like, I don't, I don't know what's gonna happen, but it's really just a, a issue in terms of data set or working set size. And we're gonna get a little bit more into that in a bit. So after I saw that, like maybe this isn't the right thing for web hosting, the next one I got to, I was like, oh my gosh, this one, okay, now we're seeing something here. And this is our MariaD pricing analytics workload. And what this basically is, is, uh, is actually based on sanitized data that's old now, but like sanitized data for a large uh, enterprise IT equipment manufacturer. And the basic idea is that it's doing uh, analytics to go and figure out um, what pricing should be, how pricing should be distribu or distributed and over like, you know, different deals. So this is actually, this is actually like if you had a um, pricing and deal management thing in a enterprise, like a multi-billion dollar enterprise, that's exactly what this thing is actually doing, which is kind of interesting. And the cool thing here is that we actually saw a pretty substantial speed up in terms of the overall performance. Um, that was just something that I was kind of excited. You know, we, we definitely saw some that didn't necessarily get benefit, but this one, we're definitely seeing a benefit. And that is because that working set size and the when you're doing pricing analytics, right, there are a lot of things that basically are very hot because they're, you know, used all the time. But then there are some things that are kind of like, you know, those kind of like weird brackets or whatever that just never get pulled into deals. And because those things aren't being pulled into deals, you tend not to use those. And so those can sit in main memory instead of sitting in cache. And this one actually fit perfectly. And this was like, wow, this is awesome. And then we got to our KVM virtualization. And this is basically just one that we've been running for years. And it's actually based on an STH reader that was like, hey, can you go run this because this is basically what my workload looks like like you know I just kind of want to see and maybe it'd be good data for you and so what basically we're doing is we have different size VMs and we're adding VMs and to and we're just kind of seeing when do we start hitting that point when the SLA is not being maintained and so basically what we're doing here is we're just kind of seeing how many VMs can we load of different sizes onto these machines before we start not hitting our SLAs and so that's kind of like the cutoff like once you can't hit your SLA we say okay done and then that basically becomes our maximum number here. And this chart I think is one of the most fascinating charts that I've seen. And so that's why I'm gonna put that into our little video here. And the reason I think it's super interesting is that when you're on kind of the smaller or medium sized VMs, we get a little bit of benefit actually over the 7763. Frankly, this is not something that to me is like shouting on the mountain, like this is the most amazing thing. Like this is the reason to go buy it because you get like all this extra, I mean, you're not getting like 40% more benefit or anything like that at that range. So it's to me like that's, okay. But then when we get to the H, which if you're kind of like small, medium, then we have L and XL, large, extra large, what's H? H is hard. Um, that's because I always like to have odd numbers of things. So we kind of came up with a VM size that was in the middle there, which is, I don't know why we came up with hard, but we did that like years ago. And so that's just what that is. Now, because we have this charted all the way up to the small as well, it doesn't necessarily look that impressive, but on a percentage basis, these things are absolutely like actually pretty nice chunks in terms of extra performance that you're getting on the larger VM sizes. And again, this all comes down to the working set size. And so I think that now that we've seen what all of the, I guess, or a lot of the scientific or simulation folks are doing in terms of high performance computing. And like, you know, we've kind of seen what that looks like. We've kind of seen some anecdotal evidence where like sometimes you're a little bit ahead, sometimes you're a little bit behind, sometimes you're about the same, and sometimes you get like a ton of benefit, right? We've seen that kind of spectrum just from the couple of benchmarks that I've presented. Plus we've seen some of that from the ISVs as well. And so I think with that, it's time to kind of go and let's kind of get to, I guess, what do we make of all this? And so I think the thing to think about here is really just the cache. The cores are basically the same cores. They may run at a little bit different clock speeds. By the way, you can actually disable the additional cache. And so you can get a little bit of thermal headroom that or power headroom that would have gone towards the SRAM dies for the extra cache. You can actually go get that back and, and get a little bit of your extra boost clocks back. But at the same time, you know, I think that the way to think about it, assuming that you're leaving everything enabled is really just how much of your data fits into and how nicely does it fit into the 
I guess, extra cache, so that extra half gigabyte of cache that's on these chips. Because if you start seeing things like you get that extra half gigabyte and that, that means that you can fit your entire working set in cache or you can fit like all your or most of your hot data in cache and, you know, have to only swap out a little bit for the main memory whenever it's kind of being used. You have some new kind of thing being used that's not necessarily as hot. If you have that kind of thing, well, then you're actually gonna be way better off with Milan X. And that's why you see some just amazing scaling. And when AMD and ISVs talk about super linear scaling, that's really what they're talking about, right? If you're able to go and like super efficiently use that cache, you get rid of all kinds of different things. Like you get rid of main memory access. You can also get rid of some need to sync to other nodes. And so between those things, you can actually get performance that's better than you would think by just you know, linearly, linearly scaling out CPUs. On the flip side, if you run things that don't necessarily need the extra cache, well, at that point, I guess you're just basically better off getting the original AMD Epic Milan series or potentially getting the frequency optimized parts. And frankly, there are a lot of things that are like that. And the reason for that is just because the idea of having this large of a cache is just not something that's been around for a long time because Intel is basically at 60 megabytes right now. Now, Sapphire Rapids, of course, is gonna have HBM on board and so, or in the high performance computing course or the HPC segment, they will have, I guess, some SKUs with HBM memory. And overall cache on chips is definitely going up. But at the same time, software is not designed for having, you know, so much cache per core when it's kind of used to there being, you know, one, two, maybe four megabytes of level three cache per core. I mean, this is just a crazy amount of cache per core. And that's really the reason that, you know, a lot of software is just not optimized for this at this point. And so that brings me to my little buyer's guide. And basically what I did here was I just kind of said, okay, well, what are all these things? What should you be looking for in Epic? And you're gonna notice one thing here that I actually do have the Epic 7002 series, which is Rome, that is, and that does have a line. And the reason for that is that there are some segments of the market that are still being serviced by Rome. Uh, we actually just purchased a couple in the last, I'd say, you know, three months, last quarter. We've purchased systems with Rome CPUs from HPE and Lenovo. And there are certain segments that Rome is really good for because they, you can actually get to lower power. And so it's just something that, you know, is still being serviced by those. You're gonna see that all the CPUs say that they're general purpose, there's some level of green for general purpose. And the reason for that is that AMD's thought is like, hey, let's just go do a bunch of cores and we'll get a lot of cache cores and let's go. Versus you're gonna see other companies like Intel or Apple saying like, hey, let's go use a lot of accelerators. And that's just a difference in design philosophy. But basically AMD's parts are very much all general purpose cores. In terms of cost optimization, both the frequency optimized and Milan X parts are definitely more costly. But on the other hand, if you have certain software packages, frankly, the extra cost for the hardware really does, is like a, a rounding error in the overall solution cost. So that's why they're yellow, not red. They cost more, but if, if you're buying those parts, it, it probably with the software side is probably negligible. The X and frequency optimized parts are definitely the higher performing parts. So I think that makes sense in Rome at this point. Like frankly, you're not gonna go buy a Rome CPU if you want like the highest performance per core at this point. It's just, it's just not as good as Milan, right? I mean, I know AMD probably doesn't want me to say that, but like, yeah, their new products are better than their old products. Like, Sure. But the one thing to remember is that those frequency optimized and the Milan X, so the cache optimized parts, they do use a lot of power, right? So because they use a lot of power, we're gonna put a red there because uh, they are burning up at like 280 watts. By the end of this year, we're gonna see definitely some way high, way hotter CPUs. And you're gonna say like 280 watts, Psh, that's nothing. But for now, those are definitely high power parts. But on the other hand, the Rome, you know, the low end Rome parts are actually fairly low power. So, um, you know, those actually can be pretty good options for that. So the Quick thing I said was like, well, why would you buy each of these? And I think that it's actually pretty easy. You purchase Milan X, so the 7003X products, because you think, hey, cash is something that my workload can use and you know I can use that extra cash. I don't have to go to memory. This is absolutely great. You buy the frequency optimized parts if you're basically paying on a uh, you know per core basis for your software licensing, or you just have an application that just absolutely needs as much performance per core as possible, as much you know clock speed as possible. Then you buy the frequency optimized parts. I think the classic Milan series or vanilla or whatever we're going to call that going forward, but just the standard Milan series, I think that's a pretty good, they have a pretty good range. They have more different core options. And so they have a whole bunch of different things there that I think make a lot of sense. And then Rome you get because maybe it's lower power and cheap. That's basically the reason. Now you're probably sitting there and thinking to yourself, hey, 
cool, but like, how do I figure out if my workload actually scales well into the larger cache sizes? And I think that the way that you would do that, or at least the way I would tell you to do that, is I would go and try it. So Microsoft Azure Cloud, you know, they're actually ripping out all of, which is crazy, but we covered this previously, they're actually ripping out all of their Milan CPUs and putting Milan uh, X CPUs in the HPC cloud. So you can definitely go try it out there. And something that you can also do is if you do have AMD CPUs, there is this tool that AMD has, and that can actually tell you whether or not you have cache misses and like, you know, how hot your data is and all that kind of stuff and, and your utilization rate. And that's something that frankly, it just actually, the tool just kind of dumps out data for you. You can also look at your working set size, but I will just quickly note here that a lot of the stuff that we were looking at, especially on the scientific side, those are like single applications, right? So your working set size, if you don't take advantage of the extra cache, well, what can basically happen is that is fine if you're running a single application per server. But what happens when you're running like a VM host or you're running like a whole bunch of containers? Well, if you remember our KVM example or virtualization example, you can actually get more performance because depending on the working set size and the number of VMs you have, you can actually more efficiently utilize that cache potentially. And that actually gives you, you know, better uh, performance. So the way I would tell you to do working set size would actually need to be, you know, use an actual system that you have running a production or close to production as you can possibly get workload. I don't necessarily think like if you have a small workload that you run a bunch of, um, I don't necessarily think that the right answer would be to go and just kind of look at each one individually. I would try to go get as many real life examples to figure out if you can use the cache. And I also think that if you're not overly frequency dependent or like, you know, there are a lot of folks that, you know, I know are more memory bound in their servers than they are CPU frequency bound. So if you are like one of those folks, I would definitely say go get Milan X and get the extra cache. And real quick, before we close out, I just wanna say that there are gonna be people that are gonna tell you, oh, there's a little bit of extra latency going to the extra cache, or maybe there's extra power because you have those extra dies. But here's basically the deal. Anything that gets cached there is basic, and anything that you hit in the, that 3D V cache, you're basically avoiding a trip to main memory. That means that you're avoiding this just giant, you know, trip out to memory in terms of latency and also power consumption. So from a package perspective and an overall system perspective, you're basically always better off if you go and hit that cache versus if you don't have the cache. Okay, so this was a super long video, but I did want to kind of go over just kind of what the high level on what the new Milan X chips are, some of the performance stuff, and also to get to, you know, bring Wendell onto the channel, which I thought was really cool. And then I also just kind of want to talk about some of the stuff that we saw in terms of performance, how to think about the overall Milan family. And I also just wanted to look at, well, you know, what makes sense? Like, how do I think about doing a purchase decision? I think we covered all those at a pretty high level, but this still was a really long video, which tells you just how complex this stuff is getting. Of course, I would expect that we're gonna have more on AMD Epic Milan CPUs and different types of CPUs going forward. So if you did like this video, well, why don't you give it a like, click subscribe, turn on those notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. As always, thanks for watching and have an awesome day. <laughs> it's totally not an awkward outro at all.